Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome from Pamela and me uh, to this, the, the third in um, uh, five webinars on cargo claims. And this is our third series, uh, the first two having been on time charters uh, and voyage charters. And our talk today will be around 50 minutes, uh, followed by uh, questions. And before we start, uh, just a few minor notes uh, to take into version of the Hague rules to account most importantly for A, inflation, and B, perhaps most crucially, containerization. As we'll go on to look at, the Hague rules contain a package limit, uh, but a package limit is nebulous in the context of a container. And so, it was considered prudent to incorporate a weight limit alongside the package limit, as the Hague Bisbee rules did. And then in 1979, uh, a subsequent protocol was agreed, which essentially brought, uh, and it's called the Special Drawing Rights Protocol, which brought into play uh, a particular way of uh, quantifying the limits of liability with reference to uh, these SCRs which we'll go on to look at. Now, you will also have come across, potentially, or certainly heard about the Hamburg rules and the Rotterdam rules. And I actually had, uh, when I prepared these slides originally, a picture of a massive red herring on this slide. But um, my very professional marketing colleagues told me that I couldn't do that, and that we needed to have something that looks uh, a little bit more um, Polish. So what we have here is someone looking very businesslike with a hard hat and a high-vis gilet on. Um, but the point that I wish to make in relation to the Hamburg rules and the Rotterdam rules is that they're simply not relevant as things stand from an English law perspective. Uh, the Hamburg rules and Rotterdam rules have been enacted in some countries, but not enough countries to gain real traction uh, in terms of their application to bills of lading from an English law perspective. So you can effectively disregard them in 99.9% .9 of cases uh, involving the carriage of goods by sea under bills of lading. So we'll now look at when the Hague rules apply, and then we'll go on to look at the hague Bisbee rules. And the Hague rules, the position essentially is quite simple. The rules were formally enacted into English law uh, via the old Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1924, but that law was repealed uh, when the hague Visby rules were brought into English law via the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1971. So the effect of that is that the Hague rules can never now compulsorily apply under English law, but that doesn't stop parties from seeking to apply them voluntarily, uh, which happens in the vast, vast majority of cases uh, under bills of lading. So most bills uh, will have some form of clause paramount, uh, which will apply the Hague rules in circumstances where the Hague Visby rules don't apply compulsorily. And the reason for that is that it is carriers that tend to draw up bills of lading, and therefore Carriers wish to avail themselves of the more preferential terms uh, if they can, and generally, depending on the weight and the number of packages of the cargo, the Hague rules will tend to provide for a lower limit of liability than the Hague Visby rules. Hence, there are often attempts to incorporate the Hague rules uh, into contracts of carriage. The Hague Visby rules, on the other hand, can and often do apply compulsorily, therefore overriding any attempts to apply the Hague rules voluntarily. And the Hague Visby rules were given force of law, as I say, by uh, the UK COGSA 1971 Act. And essentially, the key effect of that Act, in terms of the application of the rules, is that the Hague Visby rules will apply compulsorily, regardless of what the Bill of Lading says, so, for example, even if there is no clause paramount, if certain criteria are met. And those criteria relate to uh, geographical elements of where the goods were loaded and where the bill was issued, and also to 
uh, documents. What form of document uh, does the um, bill of lading or waybill actually take? And we'll look at both of those uh, in just a moment. But before doing so, there's a key point to make, which is where English law is referred to and incorporated into a bill of lading, that in and of itself will not lead to the Hague-Bisbee rules applying. These criteria as to geography and documentation still have to be met for the rules to apply. So geography, the first element of this compulsory application of the Hague-Bisbee rules. And this is all set out in Article 10C of the Hague-Bisbee rules. And it essentially provides that where the bill is issued in a contracting state or the cargo is loaded in a contracting state, regardless of the nationality of any of the interested parties or the ship, the Hague-Visby rules will apply compulsorily. And what we mean by contracting state is that uh, the country in question is an actual signatory to the convention, has signed the convention, not simply enacted domestic, uh, domestic legislation along the lines of the rules. And there are 40 or so countries that fall into that bracket, uh, including the UK and much of uh, Western Europe. Uh, interestingly, the USA has not enacted uh, or signed uh, the hague Brisby rules. Instead, uh, the USA uses uh, its own version of the Hague rules um, called US COGSA 1936, but with a different limit per package uh, or freight unit of $500. And so the question arises, well, how do you find out whether um, the country where the goods were loaded or the bill issued is a contracting state? And you can find information about that online quite easily, but you should do so with caution because all the various different ratification tables available online uh, are created by those uh, who, with the best intentions, may not uh, be conversant with the actual position in the country in question. And so you should always treat uh, those uh, sources with a degree of circumspection and caution. And if in doubt, the very best thing to do is check with local lawyers what the status uh, of the rules is in that particular country. So that's geography. We now look at uh, the type of document to which the Hague-Bisbee rules can apply compulsorily. And this is dealt with in Article 1B of the rules, which states that the rules apply uh, to contracts of carriage carried by, uh, sorry, covered by a bill of lading or any similar document of title. And that was considered by the House of Lords in a case in 2005 called the Raffaella S. And essentially what the House of Lords concluded was a straight bill, in other words, a bill of lading which refers to a named consignee rather than the consignee being to order, is a bill of lading or similar document of title. Now that needs to be distinguished from a seaway bill. A seaway bill uh, is a document which um, does not require the document itself to be presented or surrendered in exchange for the goods. So to take delivery under a seaway bill, all a party has to do is identify itself correctly as the named consignee in that way bill. And the rules will not apply, the hague Brisby rules, compulsorily to a seaway bill. And so you check to distinguish between a bill of lading and a seaway bill by firstly looking at how the document describes itself. Does it say bill of lading or does it say seaway bill uh, at the top? And whilst that won't be fully conclusive, it'll be a good indication. And secondly, you look in the bottom right hand side of the document, what it says in terms of whether the bill of lading needs to be surrendered for the goods to be delivered. And if the bill does need to be surrendered, that indicates a straight bill of lading. If it doesn't, that indicates uh, a seaway bill. Now, sometimes where the goods, for example, are lost or damaged during loading, uh, bills of lading aren't issued. And you see this very often, for example, with 
uh, liquid cargoes where uh, during first foot analysis uh, the cargo is found to be contaminated and the rest of the cargo isn't loaded and in those circumstances the question arises uh, the cargo is not loaded the bill not being issued because the contracted carriage then doesn't go forward uh, do the hate brisby rules apply compulsorily to that despite the absence of the actual issued bill and in 2002 so 20 years ago the court of appeal said yes as long as there is an intention to issue the bill of lading even if subsequent events mean that the bill isn't actually issued then the rules uh, can apply so let's summarize all of this essentially when you're looking at any bill of lading the first question you need to ask to determine which set of rules apply is do the hague Wisby rules apply compulsorily in other words where was the cargo loaded or the bill issued and is either of those a signatory state and secondly is the document in question a bill of lading whether that's a to order bill or a straight bill rather than a seaway bill and if either of those uh, is uh, the case uh, a bill of lading or a seaway bill and the geographical requirement uh, is satisfied one or other then the hague bisbee rules will apply compulsorily regardless of what the bill says but if those criteria aren't satisfied then look at the clause paramount uh, which will almost certainly be in the bill and see what it says in terms of whether or not uh, the Hague or hague Bisbee rules apply by agreement. And let's just take you through uh, an example. So this is the 1994 Condon Bill wording. And clause B simply says, the hague Bisbee rules will apply compulsorily um, if they do. So uh, that's a truism and a tautology to say the least. Uh, and it's not really that meaningful a clause, but clause A there has uh, caused a lot of ambiguity over the years. It says that the Hague rules as enacted in the country of shipment shall apply to this bill of lading. And then it says a similar thing um, in relation to uh, the corresponding country of destination, and then goes on to say that if uh, there is uh, no Hague rules incorporated, uh, into the law or enacted into the law of, of either, then the rules will nevertheless apply. And historically, there's been a real debate about the status of the Hague Visby rules in that context. And what I mean by that is, in a rather similar way to the York Antwerp rules, when looking at general average, the Hague Visby rules, as I mentioned, is simply an amended version of the Hague rules. And so the question arose, where there's a reference to the Hague rules as enacted in the country of shipment, does that mean that where the country uh, of shipment enacts the Hague Visby rules, an amended version of the Hague rules, it is those Hague Visby rules that are incorporated uh, contractually rather than compulsorily uh, into the bill of lading under those words. And the answer in Superior Pescadores was yes. Uh, a reference to the Hague rules as an action in the country of shipment is actually also a reference to the Hague Visby rules being an amended version. And that answers the long standing question. And this is, I think, the most important aspect of that case where you simply have in a charter party as incorporated into a bill of lading the words, or indeed in the bill itself, simply clause paramount to apply what does that mean and it's now settled through that case that a reference to clause paramount means a reference to the hague visby rules not to the hague rules and as we'll come on uh, to look at uh, shortly in this talk that's crucial potentially in the context of the different limitations that can apply as between the two now, Pamela, in a moment, we'll go on to look at uh, the key elements of the Hague and Hague Bisbee rules. But before, sir, before we do that, uh, there are two further points to make, uh, and those both relate to limits on the scope of application, both uh, in relation to the Hague and the Hague Bisbee rules. And the first of those is the period of coverage. 
And this is set out in Article 1E of both sets of rules. And it essentially says that uh, the rules only apply to the period from the time when the goods are loaded up to the time that they're discharged. In other words, when they're on the hook, tackle to tackle. And that has two really important consequences. Firstly, in a combined transport bill, any carriage, uh, for example, by road or by rail, uh, before loading or after discharge is not subject to the rules at all. And as a result of that, you often see, and this is consequence number two, uh, before and after clauses, as they're called, inserted into bills of lading. And the Congen Bill 94 uh, wording is the most common. The carrier shall in no case be responsible for loss of or damage to the cargo, howsoever arising prior to loading into uh, and after discharge from the vessel. And English law permits reliance on such clauses because the Hague and the Hague Bisbee rules expressly say on their own terms that they don't cover those periods. Now, the final question in terms of period of coverage, what about transshipment? And the answer is as follows. Take, for example, a liner bill where goods are to be carried from port A to port D, but the goods are transshipped at port B from one ship to another, and then again at port C. And the question arises, uh, do the rules apply to uh, the period of transshipment and the discharge and loading at each transshipment port? And the answer to that is you have to look at what the original voyage was. For an original voyage from A to D, if there's transshipment, as liner bills permit, then uh, the whole voyage from A to D is covered by the rules, including the period of transshipment and any cargo operations, discharge and loading at the transshipment port. They will all be covered by the obligations to care for the cargo properly and carefully and to exercise due diligence in terms of the seaworthiness of the ship uh, throughout all of those different voyages and different transshipment operations. And then on to uh, the final limit, and this relates to uh, which cargoes are actually covered by the Hagen Hague Bisbee rules. And this is set out in Article 1C, uh, and it involves two exceptions where the rules will not apply, both Hague and Hague Bisbee. Firstly, there's live animals. I'm not sure if any of you have had a case involving live animals at all. I've had genuinely one case involving a prize yak, uh, which was a curiosity in itself, um, but obviously that's extremely left field, and generally the key one here is uh, deck carriage. And deck carriage is excluded from the compulsory application of the Hague and Hague Bisbee rules. Um, oh, sorry, of the application voluntarily of the Hague rules or compulsorily of the Hague Bisbee and won't apply if three criteria are met. Firstly, the goods actually have to be carried on deck. Secondly, the bill needs to record that. And third, the deck carriage needs to be permissible under the contracts of carriage. And where all three criteria are met, the rules won't apply, and that means, in a similar way to before and after clauses, the carrier is entitled to rely on and to insert into the bill clauses which exclude liability for carriage on deck. And there's a, a simpler example that you see before you. And most bills will contain those wordings uh, in their standard form on the front side. Now, there's a, a complicated exception to this, uh, which is where when the hague Brisby rules uh, are applied as a result of a contractual incorporation, by which I mean wording that says the parties agree or effectively um, the rules, the hague Brisby rules will apply um, by contractual incorporation to the bill of lading and the goods are nevertheless carried on deck. There's a tension there. On the one hand, the parties uh, contractually envisage that the hague Brisby rules will apply. On the other hand, the rules themselves say that deck carriage isn't covered by the hague Brisby rules. And the answer is resolved by section 17 of COGSA 1971, 
which as I say is uh, the statute that brings um, the Hague-Bisbee rules into English law and what that says that um, section is that the Hague-Bisbee rules will apply to debt carriage if the bill expressly states that the Hague-Bisbee rules are to govern the contracts um, for example via clause paramount um, even though uh, the debt carriage exclusion exists so essentially the debt carriage exclusion is overridden by the express intentions of the parties so that's the application of the rules uh, in a nutshell and now uh, Pamela is going to talk about the key provisions in the Hague and Hague Bisbee rules looking firstly at the carrier's obligations and then at limits of liability and time bar. Okay thank you Henry. Um, now as Henry said it's it's worth looking at a few of the key rules that you are likely to encounter um, and you'll see on the slide the obligation that a carrier is under in relation to seaworthiness. Now, seaworthiness refers to matters that cover the, the vessel's ability to perform the voyage that's been contracted for. And it's essentially a question of whether the particular ship is fit to encounter the perils of the voyage. So another way of expressing this is the prudent owner test, which is if the defect existed, the question to be put is, would a prudent owner have required that it should be made good before sending his ship to sea had he known of it? If he would, the ship was not seaworthy within the meaning of the undertaking. Uh, and that was set out in the 1905 case of McFadden and Blue Star Lines that's noted on the slide. Now you will see that the obligation arises before and at the beginning of the contractual voyage, and that is the relevant time at which the carrier has to comply with the obligation to make the vessel seaworthy. Now, the obligation itself is, is not an absolute one. It is qualified uh, as one in which the carrier is required to exercise due diligence. Now, this is effectively a question of whether the carrier has exercised reasonable skill and care to make its vessel seaworthy. And that test is an objective one. Uh, it's also important to bear in mind that the duty to exercise due diligence is non-delegable. In other words, the carrier is going to remain liable to cargo interests, even if there is a failure on the part of, of someone else, either the carrier's agents or servants, um, or indeed independent contractors, to act with reasonable skill and care. Um, and another important point to note is that a finding of unseaworthiness will mean that under the Hague and Hague-Bisbee rules, uh, a carrier will not be able to rely on exceptions under Article 4, Rule 2 to escape liability. Um, and we will come on to these uh, exceptions later. Uh, now, who bears the burden of proof in establishing that a vessel is unseaworthy? Um, the conventional view is that the burden lies on cargo interests to establish in the first place that the vessel is unseaworthy. Uh, now, if it does that and establishes uh, unseaworthiness, then the burden lies on the owners to prove that they exercise due diligence, uh, as this is expressly set out uh, in Article 4, Rule 1, which is on the slide there. Now, that conventional approach was confirmed as the correct one by Mr. Justice Tier uh, in the recent CMA CGM Libra case, uh, where he pointed out, um, and I quote, that Article 4, Rule 1 provides that where loss or damage results from unseaworthiness, the burden of proving the exercise of due diligence shall be on the carrier. Thus, it deals with the burden of proof for the purposes of Article 3, Rule 1. So it's implicit in Article 4, Rule 1, that the burden of proving causative unseaworthiness must lie upon the cargo owner. But the article assumes that such unseaworthiness has been established. So seaworthiness itself is a, a concept that has a degree of flexibility um, as it has to be considered in the light of the contractual voyage that's to be made in terms of the time when it's made, how long it will take and the conditions that may be encountered. Uh, together with the particular cargo that is to be carried. So seaworthiness also includes cargo worthiness, meaning that the ship must be capable of carrying the particular cargo safely from the port of loading to the port where it will be discharged. So the characteristics of the commodity uh, or goods being carried will often need to be taken into account. Now, this slide sets out some examples of matters that can go to unseaworthiness, um, but any list 
um, shouldn't really be thought of as definitive because the court uh, are generally not prepared to consider the categories uh, as closed. Um, we are going to move on to, I'll just go back a slide, um, the Article 3, Rule 2. Sorry, just bear with me a moment. Which is set out here on this slide. So the Article 3, Rule 2 obligation is uh, subject to the provisions of Article 4 the carrier shall properly and carefully load, handle, stow, carry, keep, care for, and discharge the goods carried. So a contract of carriage may also uh, be a contract of bailment. So it's worth noting that the carrier's obligations to take reasonable care of the cargo uh, are similar to his obligations in bailment, meaning that a carrier has to um, restore the goods in the same condition as they were received. And the burden is actually on the carrier to prove that it took reasonable care of them. So there are two stages to consider. What operations um, are covered uh, and who is responsible for them and how these operations are carried out. So the obligation on the carrier relates only to that part of the relevant operation that he's agreed to undertake and be responsible for. Now, usually uh, the operations listed on the slide uh, in terms of loading, handling, uh, et cetera, will be under the master's responsibility or supervision. However, the parties can actually agree uh, a division of those functions between themselves, and often the charterer or shipper is to be responsible for one or more of the operations of loading, stowing, or discharge. Um, in other words, responsibility for operations can be transferred from the master. Uh, the Court of Appeal in, in a case called the Jordan 2 um, held that if the contract was to transfer the obligation to load, stone, discharge from the owners to the charters, <clears throat> clear words were required. Um, but there's no presumption that, for example, if the charter had simply agreed to pay for the cargo operation, he'd also agree to carry it out or be liable if it was done badly. So in other words, Article 3, Rule 2 doesn't compel the carrier to be responsible for loading and unloading. It simply means that if the carrier is to load and unload properly, uh, it, it undertakes those functions um, uh, properly and carefully. So equally, if the charters of the vessel had agreed to perform cargo operations, they would be liable if it was not done properly and carefully. Now, the question of whether the relevant operations have been carried out properly and carefully is one of fact. Now, the appropriate degree of care depends on a number of factors such as the cargo, the voyage, the vessel, and uh, the knowledge of each of those uh, which either the carrier or the cargo interests have or ought to have. So it's well established that the word properly uh, means in accordance with a sound system, and in particular one that is sound in the light of the knowledge which the carrier has or ought to have about the nature of the goods. So this standard cannot be lessened, um, and we're going to look at this a little bit later. So while the, um, the Hague and Hague Visible Rules do not deal with burdens of proof, um, it's useful bearing in mind that because the contract is one of bailment, while the cargo owner must prove the loss or damage during the relevant period, uh, the carrier has the burden of proof of showing that any such loss or damage was caused without a breach of the obligation in Article 3, Rule 2 or was caused um, by reason of a relevant exception. So proof of loss or damage to the goods does raise an inference of a breach of Article 3, Rule 2, and the burden is then on the carrier to rebut that inference if it can. So these questions of burdens of proof were considered in the Supreme Court judgment um, of Lord Sumption in the Vol Cafe case, um, and the rule as expressed at paragraph 25 of that judgment, uh, which is set out on the slide, is that the carrier must show either that the damage occurred without fault in the various respects covered by Article 3, Rule 2, or that it was caused by an accepted peril. So if the carrier can show that the loss or damage to the cargo occurred without a breach of the carrier's duty of care under Article 3, Rule 2, he will not need to rely on an exception. 
So as we saw, Article 3, Rule 2 is said to be subject to Article 4, although in this respect it simply means that uh, Rule 2 provides a number of potential defences to a carrier, uh, and some of the key ones are listed here, but as you can see, there uh, are, are many more, and you would need to look at the, um, the rules to, to, to list them all. Um, if there are concurrent causes, so there's, there's more than one cause of damage, uh, a carrier cannot rely on Article 4 Rule 2 defences where the loss or damage is also caused by a breach of Article 3.1 or 3.2. So as we have seen, the judgment of the Supreme Court in Volcafe indicates that uh, the carrier cannot rely on an Article 4 Rule 2 defence unless it can prove that the accepted peril was an effective cause of the loss and that negligence was not also uh, an effective cause. Moving on now to um, Article 3, Rule 6, the time bar. Um, this is another rule that is of, of critical importance when considering a claim in respect of loss or damage to cargo. Now, the, the wording between the Hague and hague rules has rules has some slight differences, but the main point to note is that the carrier is discharged of all liability unless suit is brought within one year of delivery of the goods or the date uh, when they should have been delivered. So it, it's worth noting that this applies only to the carrier or the ship being discharged. So any claims by the carrier, such as freight, um, if, if it's not being paid, may be subject to other time limits. Now suit includes both arbitration and court proceedings. Um, and, and being brought refers to the steps that must be taken to commence proceedings before a competent court or tribunal uh, within the relevant procedural rules. It must be brought against the correct party, so it's important that the carrier is properly identified um, at an early stage. Time will be interrupted by issuing proceedings uh, in the English High Court, and in the case of arbitration, uh, by taking the step or steps identified uh, in the relevant arbitration clause. Now, the, the one year will in most cases refer to the date on which the discharge of cargo is completed, uh, which is the usual situation uh, where delivery takes place on discharge from the vessel. So again, it's always worth checking the precise details uh, of when the cargo that is the subject of any claim is actually discharged uh, from the ship. Uh, now, Henry touched um, on package limitations and the importance uh, to a carrier. Um, and a key point to note is that there are significant differences between the Hague rules and the Hague Visby rules uh, in providing uh, a mandatory limit on a carrier's liability. So, looking first at the Hague rules, which this slide covers, um, neither the carrier nor the ship shall in any event be or become liable for any loss or damage to or in connection with goods in an amount exceeding £100 sterling per package or unit. Now, Article, 5, uh, Article 4 Rule 5 has to be read in conjunction with Article 9 uh, of the Hague Rules. So under those rules, the figure is actually gold value. Um, An authority for, for this uh, is the case of the Rosa S noted there. Um, and the Superior Pescadores case that Henry mentioned earlier um, suggested that the relevant date for converting gold value into money was the date uh, the goods were delivered or should have been delivered. Um, and it's actually quite a complex calculation to do so. Um, however, you will often find that Article 9 um, is excluded contractually um, and al an alternative amount is often inserted by the carrier. Um, and we can discuss this, um, this is going to be discussed later on. Now, the, the River Garara case, uh, which was actually about containers loaded uh, on board a vessel that subsequently sank, decided that the carrier's limit of liability under the Hague rules is not reparable to a container, but to the number of packages proved to have been loaded into it. Um, and it looked uh, uh, in, in some detail um, at, at what packages or units could be. Now, if there are packages or units and subunits of packages, it's the larger number of the smaller subpackages or units that are relevant. Uh, in a more recent case, as well as the equation, which involved a bulk cargo of fish oil, uh, 
um, the Court of Appeal made it clear that the Hague rules uh, did not apply to bulk cargoes. And in that case, a unit meant a physical item of cargo and not um, a unit of measurement. Moving on to the Hague-Visby rules, um, as Henry mentioned, uh, the monetary unit there is the, uh, the special drawing right. Um, and if you're interested, you can find currency equivalents uh, of the SDR on the website of the International Monetary Fund. I think it's updated every day. Um, so a package must indicate something that's packed. But as we've seen, the Hague Visby rules also have an alternative limit based on weight. Um, so the Hague Visby rules can apply where there are no packages or units, such as for bulk cargoes. And if, uh, as is frequently the case, you see number of packages and weights on um, the bills of lading themselves, um, and, and a, a limitation can be calculated by reference to either, then it is the higher amount that applies. So it's worth noting as well under Article uh, 4, uh, Rule 5C, uh, which says that where a container, pallet or similar article of transport is used to consolidate goods, the number of packages or units enumerated in the bill of lading as packed in such article of transport shall be deemed the number of packages or units. So for Hague Bisbee rule claims, uh, you can always look at the enumeration as described on um, the bill itself. Uh, I'm now going to hand back to Henry, who is going to uh, look at what happens when there are conflicts um, uh, between express terms in bills of lading and in the rules themselves. Thanks very much, Pam. Yes, so here we're faced with a situation where, as Pam has just described, we have a one-year time limit, we have in the Hague rules a package limit, and in the Hague Visby rules, package or weight, whichever is higher. And the question therefore arises, well, what happens if the bill of lading itself contains a contractual provision uh, which differs from those limits? And the answer uh, is uh, defined with reference to Article 3.8 of the Hague and Hague Visby rules. And what it says is any clause in a contract of carriage relieving the carrier from liability for loss or damage to goods arising from negligence, etc., um, or lessening such liability otherwise than as provided in these rules shall be null and void and of no effect. So essentially what it's saying is if a carrier tries to exclude liability or lessen liability uh, below the levels set out in the rules, uh, it cannot do so. And the question arises, what is the extent of the application of that article? And the answer is essentially defined by whether or not you're dealing with the Hague rules or the Hague Visby rules. So where the Hague Visby rules apply, as I mentioned uh, at the start of the talk, they have force of law. And the effect of that is no derogations from uh, the rules will be permitted. And so Article 3.8 is given absolutely full effect. Any terms such as uh, a lower weight or package limit or a shorter time limit that relieve or lessen liability on the part of the carrier um, will be null and void and unenforceable. But you need to contrast that position very carefully uh, with the uh, circumstances of the Hague rules applying contractually because, as mentioned, uh, they never apply compulsorily and therefore they don't have the force of law. And then the court is faced with a conundrum. On the one hand, you've got Article 3.8 that's incorporated contractually alongside the rest of the Hague rules. And on the other hand, you have an express provision, be it a time limit uh, or a, a lower package or weight limit. And the courts take the view that Article 3.8, depending on the precise wording of the Bill of Lading and how it's all set out, is unlikely to have effect against such provisions 
where the Hague rules apply uh, voluntarily. And the reason for that is if you just picture a bill of lading for a moment, take a, a liner bill where you have a clause paramount that refers to the Hague rules uh, and their incorporation, it won't set out, it never does, the rules entirely. So all you have is the wording of a clause paramount stating that the Hague rules uh, are to apply unless the Hague bits be applied compulsorily. And then you'll have an express, for example, nine month time bar. And the courts have concluded that the time bar provision, or if it's a limitation on package or weight, similar, uh, is much more likely to be uh, intended to have prevalence over Article 3.8 because it's given visual prominence as an express term uh, of the Bill of Lading. And a really good example of this uh, was in a case, uh, it was actually, uh, I think, a New Zealand case called the Tasman Discoverer uh, just under 20 years ago. And the Hague rules applied contractually uh, in that uh, bill of lading, but it also had an express package limit that was lower than the Hague rules limit. And the court had zero hesitation based on the wording of that particular bill in concluding that the express package limit took precedence over the Hague rules limit and that the Hague rules limit therefore um, wasn't protected by Article 3.8. And the, the wording in the judgment is really quite stark. The more general provision of Article 3.8 has to be related to the express limitation stated by the parties. That more specific provision has to be preferred as a matter of the common sense reading of the Bill of Lading as a whole. The party's plain purpose was to alter that aspect of the Hague Rules. That purpose must be given effect to. And this actually is a useful point generally for the interpretation uh, of um, contractual provisions, either charter parties or bills, unless there's a reason to do otherwise, such as via the application of a convention, such as the, the hague Bisbee rules, the courts really are interested in what a sensible commercial person would interpret as having been the intentions of the parties when looking at the document in question. And when you've got uh, a package limit that is very clear on the face of the bill, then that should prevail over something that's simply incorporated uh, with a reference to the rules. So I think a sensible judgment and one that um, clarifies matters, uh, albeit in favour of, of carriers, so very much to cargo interests detriment. So that deals with uh, conflicting terms in bills of lading um, and uh, in the context of the Hague and hague Bisbee rules. The next big issue in terms of contractual incorporation is what happens where you have charter party terms incorporated, so not liner bills, charter party bills, and how do those mesh with the Hague rules, and in particular the obligations under 3.1 and 3.2 uh, in relation to seaworthiness and uh, the care for the goods, and Pamela will now uh, look at this aspect. Um, thank you, Henry. Um, so, bills of lading themselves uh, may not contain many express terms, but they often um, include words of incorporation uh, of another document, usually a charter party or, or, or as we have seen, a version of the Hague Rules. Uh, and these may seek to add other terms to the bill of lading contract. So you need to look at um, three particular things. You need to look at the words of incorporation used, the type of provision um, that is sought to be incorporated. Uh, in, in other words, what does the particular term relate to? And the wording of the document that is sought to be incorporated, for example, the charter party. So general words of incorporation, such as those which refer to all clauses or all terms or all conditions, will actually incorporate only those clauses which are applicable to the contract contained in the Bill of Lading. So this is sometimes referred to as incorporating clauses which are germane to the rights and liabilities of the consignee uh, or carrier, such as the payment of freight or relating to the receipt or the carriage or delivery of the cargo. 
So general words of incorporation, it's worth bearing in mind as well, will not incorporate a provision that is contrary or inconsistent with an express term in a bill of lading contract. So you do need to consider uh, the terms of both documents. Um, law and arbitration clauses uh, need particular attention. Um, you'll see on there the, the Congen uh, 1994 bill wording. Um, which has an express incorporation um, clause there relating to law and arbitration. So charter parties, going back a step, um, will often contain a governing law clause uh, and a clause on jurisdiction, uh, which relates to where a claim can be heard. So will those clauses be incorporated into the Bill of Lading contract? Now, a governing law clause, for example, one that says English law to apply, will be incorporated by just general terms which say all terms or all conditions. However, general words of incorporation will not incorporate arbitration or jurisdiction clauses. Something more specific is required. Um, and that's why we've put the uh, congen bill wording on, uh, on the slide here, because this is an example of an express incorporation which will be sufficient and effective to incorporate the jurisdiction clause because it refers very specifically to the arbitration clause um, in the charter party. Now, which charter party is the correct one um, whose terms are to be incorporated? And that's another question that frequently arises. So if a charter party can be properly identified, it doesn't matter if the date or details are not actually apparent on the face of the bill. Um, the question is simply whether the correct charter party can be properly ascertained. If there is more than one uh, charter in respect to a particular voyage, what happens then? So if there's a series of time charter parties, uh, the general rule will be that the head charter, in other words, the one to which the carrier is a party, is the one to be incorporated. Uh, the position tends to be slightly different where, uh, as is commonly the case, the head charter is a time charter and uh, there is a sub charter, which is a voyage charter. Uh, now, on the basis that it's unlikely that the parties to a bill of lading would wish to incorporate um, the terms of a time charter, which is, is different in kind to a voyage charter, uh, the, the incorporation will actually be of the voyage charter. Um, and where you find that there's a series of, uh, a series of sub voyage charter parties, it's usually going to be the head voyage charter in the chain that is incorporated. Um, charter parties, um, whether those are voyage or time charters, uh, frequently uh, make loading and storage the responsibility of the charterer, um, whether in whole or in part. So where a bill incorporates the terms of such a charter, that uh, raises two related questions. The first of these is what is the contractual effect of such a provision where it's incorporated into the bill? Um, and secondly, will that provision fall foul of Article 3, Rule 8 of the Hague Rules in derogating from the carrier's obligations under rule, Article 3, Rule 2, which is what Henry's just, just discussed. Now, um, both questions were considered in the Eames Solar case, which is noted on the slide there. Now, that claim was in relation to uh, damage to a cargo of steel. The Bill of Lading was on a congen Bill 1994 form, whose wording incorporated the terms of a charter which provided for loading and, loading and storage to be the responsibility of the charterers. Now, the damage in that case to the steel occurred because of poor stowage, um, which was the responsibility of the charterers. Uh, and the judge in that case held that the words of incorporation were effective to ensure that owners were not responsible for stowage or liable for the consequences of poor stowage. Now, the rationale for this, uh, uh, this rule is uh, that the Hague rules themselves um, and Article 3, Rule 2 in particular, set standards of care rather than setting out what duties are to be performed. Um, so although it's open to the parties to agree who is to perform those duties, it's not permissible to have terms that alter or lessen the standard to which a carrier must perform those operations, um, and such provisions would be invalid if, uh, if they were tried. Um, now, a clause which simply requires the charterer to pay for loading and storage or discharge, in other words, uh, 
a clause which makes it free of expense to the owners will not necessarily transfer responsibility. Um, see the case of the Jordan 2 listed there, where it was held that in such cases, um, it's limited to the cost of the operation. So the terms uh, FIOS and FIOS, which uh, stand for free in and out stowed, and free in and out stowed or trimmed, uh, simply mean that the cost of loading, stowing, and, and possibly trimming and discharging is free for the carrier. Um, similarly, bills of lading often incorporate charter party terms covering responsibility for stevedores. Uh, again, a distinction has to be drawn between the costs and responsibility for appointment of stevedores and responsibility for their actions. Um, a good example is the case um, reported, uh, uh, the London Arbitration uh, case uh, number 18 of 2013, um, which was not on the sugar charter party form. Um, in that case, that said that stevedores for loading, stowing, trimming and discharging to be employed by charters or shippers or receivers at their expense and under master's control, stevedores to be considered as owner's servants. Uh, the result in that case was that the cargo interests were responsible for the costs of stevedores and for appointing them. Um, the duty in that case was absolute. So, if they appoint incompetent stevedores, the carrier is not responsible. The carrier is, however, responsible if the stevedores, although competent, are, are actually negligent because they are said to be under the master's control. Um, now, issues of incompetence and negligence uh, often arise, but incompetence is generally thought of as a consistent course of conduct that uh, falls well below what would be regarded as satisfactory in all the circumstances. Uh, and a good example of a case uh, where that happened was the Clipper Saint Louise, uh, if you want to go and read the details of that. So that, I think, covers um, all the slides and all the topics we're going to talk about. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Um, please feel free to type them in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, we had one question put to us um, uh, asking about whether or not um, demurrage provisions from a charter party would be uh, incorporated where there was a clause in the Bill of um, Lading incorporating all clauses from um, the, the charter party. Um, now that raises quite difficult issues because um, there was a case called the Miramar that looked at this um, and in that case the House of Lords refused to accept uh, that uh, uh, a consignee uh, should be responsible um, for uh, demurrage um, because it, it considered that it couldn't possibly be, have been the intention of the parties for a consignee who happened to be a consignee of only part of a cargo should be held liable to pay all demurrage that might accrue in relation to the ship. So although demurrage is um, a provision which is germane to the loading and discharge of goods, and in that particular case the, the words of incorporation were wide, uh, a court will not necessarily agree that it should be incorporated where it would commercially uh, be nonsensical or, or indeed where they were, there was too much verbal manipulation involved in trying to make uh, a consignee uh, responsible for demurrage that accrued under a charter party. Thank you, Pam, um, very much. Uh, there are two other questions that have been put to us. Uh, one of those isn't uh, wholly clear to me in terms of um, what we need to answer. So um, to the person that kindly asked that question, we'll get back to you. Uh, individually after this, um, just to follow up on that. But the second question is, where there are two voyage charters uh, of the same date, how do you determine which one is incorporated? And that's a pertinent question. We've had exactly that situation. And the short answer is, it's the one higher up the chain. And there are two cases that deal with which charter party. There's the, uh, the Heidberg and the San Nicolas. And so you look to the voyage charter, that is further towards the registered ownership of the vessel, and that is the charter that will be incorporated if the date um, is shared by both. 
So thank you very much. Um, we're at 11.03 now, um, so we're three minutes over, and uh, we have no doubt that uh, you have extremely busy days to get to. And therefore, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Uh, we hope that this has been useful. Uh, and um, there are two more talks. Uh, the next one is on the 25th of May, and that will deal with evidential matters in bills of lading. So we hope uh, to see you there. But in the meantime, uh, go well. And as I say, thank you so much uh, for all of your attendance today.